Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here, isn't it? My name's Stephen, and I'm, I'm one of the members here at uh, Hope Community Church, and it is nice to see everyone here, as usual. And we're going to be continuing our studies in the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. We, just got a sh- we haven't got the whole chapter that uh, was read to us. We've just got verses 13 to 17 to look at this morning. Hold on to the truth. A couple of weeks ago, I was really quite upset. Actually, that's not right. I was really quite angry about hearing, on hearing the news at 6 o'clock or whenever it was one evening. Uh, You may say to to me, well, Stephen, where have you been? I get upset watching the news every day. And you've got a point. But for me, it was about the government's bounce-back loan scheme. You may have heard of it. It's a government-backed loan available to businesses to allow them quick access, easy access to finance during the coronavirus outbreak. And we in our business took one of these loans out to help with cash flow. And it is, as it says on the tin, quick and easy. The upsetting thing is to hear how this system has been so very abused. Uh, During lockdown, Companies House saw a massive rise in new company registrations, which, of course, is quite sort of uh, unusual at a time of such economic hardship. And, of course, many of these were bogus companies being set up just to uh, get hold of the money through the bounce-back loan scheme and make off with it. And in such a challenging time for our nation, wouldn't you have thought that people would pull together? Uh, These fraudsters have stolen millions of pounds at a time of national crisis. And they've deceived not only our banks, but the government... And, of course, us too, because ultimately, we, the taxpayer, are going to be paying for their deceit. So, I'm sorry, I've had a good moan this morning to start off with. But, actually, as Peter and Hilary led us in prayer this morning, we know that deceit is not just out there somewhere. It's closer to home. It's closer to all of us. And if we look honestly at our own lives and think about our struggles with sin, our personal struggles with attraction to the world and distraction by the world, and we know it's a world that is so hugely opposed to Christ and to our God. So are there times where you find yourself asking, is there anything that can give me some kind of assurance that I'm on the right track? Am I actually safe? Well, from the passage this morning, you'll see that the believers in Thessalonica were probably feeling like this. They had been deceived. Some false teachers had been around claiming that the day of the Lord had already come, and even saying that this teaching was from the Apostle Paul himself. So it's not surprising that this church was unsettled and alarmed. And Paul spends the first 12 verses of this chapter trying to set their minds at rest, assuring them that the day of the Lord had not come and gone. It had not come and gone unnoticed, because something has to happen first, which will be a dramatic warning to the Lord's people. The man of lawlessness will emerge, the Antichrist. But in the verses that we shall be looking at this morning, Paul gives us an overview of the whole process of salvation, stretching from eternity past to eternity future. And he is absolutely confident about the outcome for the church in Thessalonica, Because at the heart of it all is the principle that when God sets out to save a person, a happy ending 
is never in doubt. And that's why Paul starts with thanksgiving. Because the Thessalonian believers may have been deceived with the false teaching and got things wrong, but, he says in verse 13, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits. The first of God's actions is that he loved them. More specifically, Paul says, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. And, in the same, and the same in verse 16 when he prays, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us. There's something to notice here, and that is that they are loved by the Lord. This is as something that's happened in the past, specific actions in the past. What are these actions? Well, we see this love in everything about Jesus' life, in him being born into this world, in his fight against Satan, in his determination to carry out his father's will, even though it caused him so much pain. And most supremely, we see Christ's past love for us in his perfect obedience to the will of God to go to the cross. That once and for all, past historical event that has lasting significance for the whole human race. And it's like Paul is saying to them and to us, look, look back to the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you'll find your first grounds for assurance. You may be fools in the eyes of the whole world, but in the eyes of the Lord Jesus, you are his beloved people. Just imagine how encouraging that would have been for these persecuted people. How assuring to know that they were loved by the Lord. And when things are tough, as it was for these Thessalonian believers, when life is not going well, when things are not going as you hoped they would, it's so easy to think the opposite that God doesn't care. But that's just not right. Jesus never promised that things would be easy for his people. In this world, you will have trouble, he said. But take heart. I have overcome this world. We we can't measure God's love for us on the basis of our quality of life. And we need to be alert to those who deceive by promising health, wealth, and prosperity in Jesus. The Christian's strength and assurance for the present is rooted in the love of Jesus poured out on the cross, the greatest historical event the world has ever seen, an event which has enduring significance for all who believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The first of God's actions, he loved. Next, he chose. But we always, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Now, don't misunderstand this. It doesn't mean that sort of God looked out and saw how great you were and kind of headhunted you for all the best gifts and, uh, and for all the best personalities. No, he didn't do that. God decided whom he would save from the beginning. It's a sovereign act. Paul says elsewhere, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And if you've got an ESV or an NIV newer Bible, you'll notice there's a footnote beside the word first fruits, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved. Why? Why? Well, it's because some manuscripts 
give a slightly different translation. They say, from the beginning, God chose you. So if we take the, the latter translation, from the beginning, God chose you, it means that God chose them in eternity past. So there's nothing that can threaten or reverse God's choice of his people. They are totally secure, chosen by God. And this choice of God was made not based on their life or performance, because they hadn't been born. In fact, life had not come into existence. Nothing had been created. That's encouraging, isn't it? And the other way of reading this is that God chose you as first fruits to be saved. And that's also a great encouragement for the church. First fruits is that expression that uh, we use to describe the, the beginning of a crop. The church here is the first fruits of God's harvest. The believers in Thessalonica were most likely some of the first followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is probably one of Paul's earliest letters. So the church was young. It didn't have 2,000 years of history to look back upon as we do. And Paul wants to assure them that there are many, many more out there who will be included just as they have been. He's sort of saying, you've been chosen to be part of something that is much, much bigger than you. And we need to remember this when we're discouraged. When we hear on the news again of laws being passed and the things that our children are going to be taught in school which are so contrary to God's ways. When we encounter such apathy to the gospel and the hardness of people around to Christianity, it's so easy to become disheartened but we must be encouraged that we are, some, we are part of something that is so much bigger because God is at work. I read that um, in some statistics about religion in 2019, Christianity is barely growing in Europe. The growth rate was 0.04%. And I think we can relate to that in this country here, can't we? But it may surprise you to discover the greatest rate of evangelical growth can be found in Iran, where, believe it or not, the growth rate, they say, is 19.6% for evangelical population. And what about Afghanistan, where the evangelical population is growing at a rate of 16.7%, which is actually more than four times the overall annual population growth rate. God is at work. God is building his worldwide church. And being chosen by God means that we're part of his family, the family of God. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, Loved by the Lord. We have, the, we have God as our Father. We have Jesus Christ as our elder brother, our Saviour. And we are bound together by the Holy Spirit. We are brothers and sisters. We are family. So we've seen how God acted in his love. We've seen how his people are chosen from the beginning. And next, Paul describes the means God uses to call his chosen people. God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So when God, in eternity past, chose to save the believers in Thessalonica, he decided to do it through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the word sanctify means to make holy, to set aside for God. And so it follows, doesn't it, that 
the work of God's Holy Spirit, who is holy, is to bring people to God and to make them holy. But Paul says here there is something else which is absolutely essential in our salvation. If we look at verse 13 again, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, he is God's means, and through belief in the truth. Now, back in verse 10 from last week's passage and sermon, you'll remember that those who refuse to love the truth will perish. That's what it says in verse 10. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And for the avoidance of any doubt, verse 12 says, all will be condemned who have not believed the truth. But in contrast... The Thessalonian believers have been chosen by God to be saved. How? Paul says it is through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth. How was that truth communicated to them? Verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel. Through our gospel. And this is where we we must be clear that it is the gospel. It is the truth about Jesus applied by the Spirit that saves people. That's what saves me. That's what saves you. That's what saves any of us. There is no salvation outside of that. Outside of that, there is only perishing and condemnation. So in the end, it comes down to truth. It is God's word in the hands of God's Spirit that does the work of creating a people and setting them apart to be his very own. And that's why God's word, the truth, must have preeminence in our lives, in our meetings together, in our relationships, when we speak to one another, as we go about our daily lives. We often pray, don't we, that we would not only hear God's word, but be changed by it. We want God, by his spirit, to do his work in our lives to transform us. Now, this is not an exercise in intensive Bible study to become so knowledgeable uh, about the Bible, per se. Knowledge alone won't save us. What we pray for is that God's truth will transform us, that it will reorientate our lives, that it would shape our wills, and that it would capture our hearts to give us a greater vision of where we're going. And when we pray for our church here, Hope Community Church, and for the Lord to help us impact this community, Let's not just pray for a reputation for good Bible teaching. Now, naturally, we want that. But let's pray that Hope Community Church will be known as a people who are shaped and changed by the truth of God's word, the gospel. We talk a lot about the gospel, don't we? But what is it, actually, It's the message of truth. It involves words. It needs to be proclaimed and it needs explanation and persuasion. There are many good things that we could do in this world. We heard this week, didn't we, that the United Nations World Food Programme has won the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize. That's a really good thing. We too, we could could fight for good things. We could fight for political change, for social justice. We could work to try to end world poverty. But at the end of the day, this is not the work that Jesus gave us to do. Our work is to spread the gospel, the message of sins forgiven through the death of the Lord Jesus, 
the promise of salvation from the wrath of God, the promise of escape from eternity in hell, the promise of being gathered together to be with Jesus forever. And it's the work of God's people, brothers and sisters, that's you and me here at Hope Community Church, to spread that word to a lost world. So pray. Pray for this church that God would use us here in Biddenden. We are God's gospel messengers. And we pray that he would have the ways and the means that we don't know yet about as to how we go about taking this glorious gospel message to the people of Biddenden. So, to recap, we've seen how God acted in salvation. We've looked at the means God uses in salvation. And now we're going to look at God's intent in salvation. Verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate destiny of Christians is to share in the glory of Christ. Now back in chapter 1, Paul spoke of Christ's return. And on that glorious day, Jesus will be glorified um, and wonderfully, his holy people will be glorified with him. They will be transformed and become more and more like him. There is a destination for that transformation. There's a, a final end to the story, and the end of the story is glory. Now, it's important to be able to see the end, isn't it? It enables us to keep going. You may have heard of the American record-breaking long-distance swimmer, Florence Chadwick. When well, in 1950, she attempted to swim from Catalina Island, which is off the California coast, about 44 miles, to the mainland. And she set off, and the day was cold and foggy, and she could barely make out anything in the fog. And after, can you imagine it, 15 hours of swimming, she ended up begging to be taken out of the water. But her trainer urged her, you're almost there, you're so close. But she couldn't see the shore, and so she got out, got into the boat, and they sailed to the coast, which was just half a mile away. She had swum 43 and a half miles in the open sea and had given up with just half a mile to go because she couldn't see the shore. And when interviewed about it afterwards, she said, if I, had, if I could have seen the shore, I'm sure I would have made it. And sure enough, two months later, on a bright sunny day, she proved her point and swam the distance becoming the first person to swim the Catalina Channel. And the point is, seeing the end goal is essential to keep going. And Paul's message to this church and to us is, keep going. The end of the road is glory. Keep your eyes on glory. You will share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is God's intent for your salvation. He has acted in the past. He has loved. He has chosen. He has sanctified through belief in the truth of the gospel. And his intent is to take you to glory. And by reminding these Thessalonian believers of the whole grand sweep of it, Paul wants them to grasp that no one is more secure than a Christian. Be assured, this is what God has done for you. And as a further encouragement in these few verses, we see that the three persons of the Godhead have worked to make you a Christian. You are loved by the Lord Jesus. 
chosen by God the Father, set apart by the Holy Spirit. What great assurance for the Thessalonian believers and for us. The triune God is fully involved in our salvation and his purposes cannot be thwarted. We can understand why Jesus said there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What about us? What do we need to do? Does the assurance of our salvation mean that we can now sit back and relax? Does God say, right, sit back, put your feet up, enjoy the ride. There's nothing more to do. You've done it all. Well, Paul says, has something to say about this. Verse 15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. You remember how the Thessalonian believers were feeling at the beginning of chapter 2? They were unsettled and alarmed by the false teaching. And now Paul gives them the medicine for that, to stand firm. To stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And in the NIV Bible, again, there is a, a, a word, uh, there is a note beside the word teachings, which tells us that it can also be translated traditions. A tradition is something that is passed down. Everything Paul taught had come from the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus was the source and authority of all that Paul taught. So you see that Paul's appeal in verse 15 to stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you is not so much a personal appeal for them to hold on to his, his teachings but a call for the Thessalonians for them to hold to the very words of Jesus. Paul is saying to them, look, you need to hold on to this teaching. It's what I've taught you. It's what I've written to you about. It sources the Lord Jesus. It's something you need to hold on to. You need to pass it on, pick up the torch and run with it. And here we are. Today, 2,000 years later, reading the same letters, trusting in the same teaching. It's not new, it's ancient. It sources the Lord Jesus himself. And we too must hold on to it, pass it on and run with it. You need to hold on to the truth of the gospel. And that, my friends, leads into our last point. We need to hold on to it in God's strength. Verse 16, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. What a wonderfully apt prayer for the Thessalonian church. This was a church whose hope had been shaken, a church which had to carry on facing persecution and discrimination. And Paul gives them the assurance of God's sovereign love and grace. The point is that it is God who will enable them to stand firm. He will strengthen them to hold on in the present. So when they arrive in glory, they won't look back and think, gosh, that was hard work, but we did it. They're going to thank God because he did it. You know your history, don't you? Do you know this gentleman? Well, his name's there. 
Bartolomeu Dias, you'll say the, the Portuguese explorer, which is spot on. And in 1488, he became the first European to sail around the southernmost tip of Africa. And because of the terrible weather there, he described it as the Cape of Storms, Cabo das Tormentas. And later, however, as we know, it was renamed because it represented the passageway to the great riches of the East, and so it became known as the Cape of Good Hope. So what does this, this mean for us? God, by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. The weather might be terrible, the storms might be horrific, but it's still the cape of good hope. Believers in Thessalonica, believers of Hope Community Church, the storms might be horrific, but you have a good hope to hold on to. It's a good hope that's grounded in God's past actions. It's grounded in God's means. And it's grounded in God's intent to bring you to glory. It's a good hope. And it's contained in his word. And we need to stand firm and hold on to it in his strength until the day that we share in his glory.